Hi, my name is Brad Neal with the University of Indianapolis, and let's talk about atoms, molecules, and ions. So um, make sure that you do the assigned reading. So this particular video is going to be over atomic structure and symbolism. Um, and I want to go through and I want to specifically highlight one thing that's going to be really important for you to make sure that you have down throughout really the rest of chemistry. This uh, concept that we're going to be talking about um, is very, very important, especially for some of the more advanced things in the chemical industry and chemistry in general. And that is isotopes. Um, so the key thing about an isotope is it is a substance, it's two substances, right? For you to have an isotope, you really, like an isotope is the singular, but um, plural, you gotta have two. They have the exact same number of protons, but they have different neutrons. So the example that we have here is, um, the example we have here on the screen is C14 and C12. Um, and C is the symbol for carbon, and we already had that kind of come up here. So we list this out, and based off of that elemental symbol, we can say, yep, we've got carbon. Now the bottom number is going to be our atomic number, and our atomic number is going to be the number of protons that we have. So we can tell here for C12, C14, the top one, and that bottom one here, um, they have the exact same number of protons. Because they have the exact same number of protons, it is the exact same element. If you change the number of protons, you change the element. So you have to make sure if it's an isotope, it has the exact same number of protons. Isotopes have the exact same number of protons. The difference is the neutrons. And that's why their mass number, the number above, or this like 14 right here, um, those are different because the number of neutrons are different between these two things. What that ends up allowing us to do is a variety of things in the real world. So one thing is isotopic labeling. Um, so different isotopes behave differently. For example, C14 is radioactive. So it decays over time at a rate that is very knowable. Um, we've studied the as humanity, we've studied the snot out of that. And so when you hear carbon dating as a term, what they're doing is they're looking at how much C14 there is in a sample relative to the amount of C12 there is in a sample. So you take both those isotopes because they exist in nature next to one another. We know what their abundancies in nature is. Um, and then when something has died, it no longer is taking in any new carbon because it's not eating anymore. And because it's not taking in any new carbon, the amount of C14 then starts to go down, starts to decrease. So that because it undergoes radioactive decay. So the amount of C12 relative to the amount of C14 changes over time. And it's that change in uh, ratio that allows us it's one of the key components of doing carbon dating. Again, I just you have to make sure that you know this. Isotopes have the exact same atomic number. Atomic number means number of protons. Mass number is going to be protons plus neutrons. So if we look at both of these examples, we can see the number of protons in our carbon-12, the top one, is going to be six protons plus six neutrons to equal 12. However, the mass number for our C14 right here, that is telling us 14 minus six, the six protons, leaves us eight. Eight then would be the number of neutrons. So our neutrons over here, we can always find that out by taking the mass number and subtracting out the atomic number from it. Whatever is left is the number of our neutrons. And I mentioned that natural abundancy thing uh, with respect to C12 and C14. Here's another pretty classic example. Um, so most of the time, whenever we talk about the element hydrogen, we talk about hydrogen where it's got one proton 
and that's it. It doesn't have any neutrons on it. So that's why the mass number and the atomic number for protium, that top one in this chart, that's why they're the exact same thing. There are no neutrons, so its mass number does equal its atomic number. And you can see in the chart, it goes through and it says the atomic number, and it's got your number of protons, it's got your number of neutrons, and then it's got your atomic mass. And the last column is that natural abundancy. So in nature, this isotope accounts for 99.989% of all hydrogen isotopes out there. So that's by and far the vast majority. However, there's this one called deuterium. And deuterium, if we look at the table, has a different, uh, has a different mass number. And that's because its atomic number is still one, because if we change the protons, then we've changed the element. So the mass, the atomic number is one, the number of protons is one, but now we have one neutron. And that's why we have that written out in that column. Notice how the mass has increased. The mass has increased because we've added a neutron. We didn't change the element. We just have a different isotope of hydrogen. We call this one deuterium. And this one's very important in um, understanding, uh, well, atomic, anything that has to do with um, atomic bombs, any atomic power, that kind of thing. Deuterium is an incredibly important uh, element I'm sorry, an isotope of hydrogen um, because we're able to do different things with it. So we've mentioned now protons and neutrons. There's one other component that creates the entire mass of an atom. And our atoms are composed of three things, electrons, protons, neutrons. And so we've got that listed here in this table. Now, I need you to understand here, and I know we've got this location here first. What I want to skip over to is the mass column first. Compare the mass of a proton and a neutron, and they're practically identical. In fact, for our course, we are going to treat the masses of a proton and a neutron as equivalent to one another. However, the mass of an electron is ridiculously small compared to the mass of a proton. So small, in fact, that we're most of the time going to be able to treat it as negligible. And this is going to especially hold true for our bigger atoms, like something like uranium. So we've got a lot of protons and a lot of neutrons. Our mass number is going to be, for some isotopes, 238 or 235. So that's, 200, that's a combination of 238 or a combination of 235 protons and neutrons. And relatively speaking, yeah, we have a large number of electrons there as well. But because their masses are so small, the vast majority of the actual mass of an atom are going to come from the count of protons and neutrons. That said, let's talk about where we can find these subatomic particles at. The electron is going to be found outside of the nucleus. The nucleus is going to be something that we're going to talk more in detail about what that looks like um, and the shape uh, in your book as well as some, pre some videos here in the future. Um, and especially when we get out into further chapters of the, uh, of the course. Right now, though, I need you to know that the electron is outside of the nucleus. So think of it as being the, on the outer bleeding edge of what we consider an atom, an atom's volume to be. However, the proton and the neutron are going to be next to one another, and they're going to be there in the dead center of our atom. So they're going to be in here, and the electrons are going to be floating around and then taking you know, in some kind of space and that entire space, the volume, the electron, the space that the volume, mm, space that the electrons take up and the space that the nucleus takes up, all of that in aggregate is going to be considered our atom. Now let's take a look at the charge of these things. So we measure charge in coulombs. That 
we've we're not going to really go in depth in the coulombs in uh, general chemistry one we'll talk more about it in general chemistry two and you're definitely going to talk about it in physics so while there is a number that's associated with this the key thing that we can take from this charge column is the charge of an electron is the exact opposite of a charge of a proton they have the exact same charge they're just opposites of one another so we can make life easier for ourselves then and say well we can just count the number of protons we have we can count the number of electrons we have and since they both have the same magnitude of charge we can just say cool let's count for every electron it's a negative one unit charge and for every proton it's a positive one unit charge and this is just because we can take that charge divide it by itself come up with that nice whole number that away and it will still work out and everything will still nicely cancel. Okay, last thing on this. Let's take a look at these masses. The masses of these particles are ridiculously small. This is times 10 to the negative 24th grams. Atoms are ridiculously itty bitty. And beyond that, the subatomic particles are even smaller than the, the atom because the atom is like all the aggregate electrons and protons and neutrons but when we look at the little bitty things those electrons protons and neutrons that make up the atom they're even smaller so these numbers are going to be really really tiny so let's talk very quickly then about the average value that's going to come from isotopes and their relative abundance. We've had these, uh, like on this table back here, we talked and we said, yeah, 99.989% of all the hydrogen in the world is this protium, but there's this small amount of deuterium and there's these like almost like indetectably small amounts of tritium that exist in the world. If we're going to assign an overall average atomic mass for all of the hydrogen that exists, all of the possible isotopes, we need that average atomic mass to reflect the individual masses of each isotope and how much of each of those isotopes we actually have. And that's where this equation that is on the screen comes into play. So we're going to say the average mass is going to be the sum of, that's what that kind of, that Greek symbol sigma there is telling us. It's the sum of the fractional abundance. So how much, how, how abundant our element is in fraction form multiplied by its atomic mass plus the exact same kind of calculation for any other isotopes that might exist. So you would say here for hydrogen, we would have the fractional abundance of protium, so that 99.989, turn that into a fraction, so divide the 99.989 by 100, multiply that by the atomic mass, which was given to us on that table, plus the fractional abundance of our deuterium, which was... There it is, the 0.0115%. So turn that into its fractional form. So divide that 0.0115 by 100 and multiply it by its atomic mass. Its atomic mass is this 2.0141. And this atomic mass is coming from the number of protons plus the number of neutrons and some additional math that we did not discuss in the video, it's in your book. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on that additional math in this course specifically. These atomic mass units here are not gonna be numbers that I'm going to expect you to have memorized. These are in tables, you'll be able to look them up as you'll need them. Or conversely, you could possibly be asked to solve for one if it's the only piece of information that is missing from a problem. So this is how, this equation right here is how we actually solve for what that average mass 
for an element is. And the number you see on a periodic table that is reported is not the atomic mass of a specific isotope. It's in fact the average mass of all the isotopes. And that average mass comes from how much each isotope exists times that isotope's mass. So what is it that makes atoms of different elements have different properties? Well, there's a number of things. The first one is the number and arrangement of electrons and protons. Electrons do a lot of the work in chemistry, and electrons are very much influenced by the number of protons that we have. So if you change up the number of electrons, that's how, and you change what the electrons are doing, that's where a lot of the chemistry occurs in chemistry. So we need to be able to know then, if it's the protons and the electrons that are doing the jazz, we need to know how many electrons a particular element has. The nice thing here is the atomic number is going to be equal to that number of protons. Like we've said before, the mass number is the protons and the neutrons. And in the case of a neutral atom, that means an, that means an atom where it has no charge on it no positive or negative and you normally see the positive and negative to the upper right hand corner of where the carbon is if there was a charge like right here you don't see any plus or minus around any of that so it's neutral it's electrically neutral we would say by being neutral it has to have the exact same number of protons and electrons by our definitions that we've talked about previously and that, that are in the reading so if you know that you have a neutral atom and you know the number of protons in the neutral atom, that is how many electrons you will have as well. So we have a neutral carbon. Carbon has six protons because its atomic number is six. Six protons means six electrons if the carbon is neutral. It is, we know it's neutral because we don't see any positive or negative signs around that atomic symbol. So that is where we're going to leave the information for the uh, discussion about isotopes and some kind of the reminders, key takeaways from the reading here. One thing I would point out on this slide is a lot of times you're not going to see information presented to you about elements in the exact way that we have written here. This form, uh, this way of writing out chemical information is what we're going to do a lot um, in class. And this would be something that you would do to communicate, especially if you're dealing with isotopes of various species um, to other readers, other chemists, etc. But when you go to a periodic table, you're gonna see something that looks more like what you see here with our atomic number being in the upper left-hand corner. You'll see an atomic symbol. You're gonna see the atomic mass, and that atomic mass is the average mass based off of those abundances that we spoke about previously. And if it's a nice periodic table, it's also gonna tell you what the name of the thing is. There's other things, too, that this periodic table tells you, such as are you a metal or are you a non-metal, but we'll discuss that in a future video. For now, um, please note this is usually the way the information is going to be presented to you, especially in, on a periodic table. But from the information on a periodic table, such as this, you could be able to say, okay, this is my average mass, or this is my average atomic mass, this is my atomic number, I should have an idea of how many protons to neutrons there are. Because in this scenario, I have one atomic as my atomic number, so that means I have one proton. My atomic mass is incredibly close to one, thus and therefore, since I have a one-to-one -one ratio here, I probably have no neutrons. And if you can see it, helium up here in the left-hand corner, it's got a two, or I'm sorry, up in the upper right-hand corner of your periodic table, it has a two for its atomic number, but its atomic mass is four, four and change, 4.003. Take, take that atomic mass, that four, subtract the atomic number, two, and you are left with two. So our helium should have 
two neutrons in it. We would also expect that since our atomic number is two for our helium, a neutral helium atom would have two electrons on it. So we can practice that exercise with every single element on down through the entire periodic table. Please let me know if you have any questions and I hope that helps and talk with you soon.